your questions about animal senses. But first, we have a couple of things that we need to go over. Today's program is, you guessed it, all about senses, sight, smell, sound, and everything in between. If at any time you have a question, just pop it in the comments and one of these three brilliant naturalists will answer it for you. This program will be recorded and available for re-watching or sharing on our YouTube channel. And you can expect this to last about 30 to 45 minutes. Each person up here has picked their favorite thing about census to talk about and will answer some questions that have already been submitted to us and answer all of yours as well. Uh, we'll have a new Nature Chatters program every Friday this semester beginning at 10 a.m. And you can find the live stream on YouTube, which is where we ask that you submit your comments and your questions during the live event so we can see them and we can get your questions answered by these naturalists. A complete schedule of topics and age groups, or I'm sorry, just topics because all of these are great for everybody, can be found at the link below or on our website. And we encourage you to submit your questions before the live event so our staff can give you the best possible answer that we can give you. And our next Nature Chatter is on October 9th, and we'll be covering flight, which I'm really excited about. Um, more details on that will be given at the end of today's program. And with that, let's meet our naturalists. Good morning. I'm Deb, and I'm an educator and naturalist here at the Great Plains Nature Center. We're excited you're joining us today. Good morning. I'm Erica Guernsey. I'm also a naturalist here at the Nature Center. And I am Emily, and I am also a naturalist and super excited to chat with you guys about census. Okay, so now each naturalist will do a quick five minute presentation on the thing that got them excited about animal senses. So Deb, I think we'll start with you today. What, what's something that inspired you to really get into senses or what gets you excited about them? Oh, Deb, I think you're on mute still. Uh, no. Yep, you're good. Oh. Okay, it's the opposite. There, you there we go. Technology. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the one that I since that I was going to talk more about today, hearing. <laughs> so you have to be unmuted to be able to hear all the wonderful sounds in nature. Like for instance, I was out on the golf course Wednesday morning and I could hear the sound of a metal lark. And they have a beautiful sound. So I think we already have the first picture up here that might talk to us a little bit about how it is that we are able to hear these beautiful sounds in nature. Uh, first thing is that we've got these things on the outside of our heads called the pinna. And uh, not all animals have those, but we're fortunate because they act like a funnel for sound that helps to uh, direct the sound to our ear so that our ear can vibrate with those that energy and then send the messages to our brain to help us decipher what that beautiful sound that we might have heard is. Um, a pinna kind of acts like a funnel. So I made just a little funnel right here. It's just a paper cup. And what it does, if you hold it up to your ear, is that it kind of amplifies that sound. So if I turn my head around as far as I can, then as I move that uh, head and the cup around with it, I'm able to hear sounds a little bit better. I'm amplifying the sounds. So that's what pinna are good for. Um, you also saw in the picture that uh, some animals' ears are really huge and some of them are <clears throat> a little smaller. We'll see that in just a little bit, but a pinna, the pinna are a funnel for sound. Um, you might also call the pinna oracles, which is just another name for them, but it's uh, those pinna that help to focus the sound for us. Um, we might also consider that in nature, we have animals with all different kinds of ears. Like for instance, on our next slide, we have some predators that we might find in nature. You notice that the size of those ears varies greatly. Um, that might have to do where with these animals live um, and also what they hunt could determine maybe the size of ears that they have that they've developed over time. You notice in the picture on the bear that they're kind of small and they're rounded ears, but they mostly face forward to help them to hear the prey that they're searching for. 
We have over here on the left-hand side a type of cat that has kind of those really pointy ears. And again, they're mostly facing forward, but they might also have the ability to move those ears. Um, some of the feline species can move them 180 degrees in order to help them to hear their prey a little bit better. And then in the bottom left picture, you have a little fox. And their ears, again, are mostly forward facing to help them to hear their prey as well as they can. Um, some animal, rat like rabbits have really tall ears. We might think about that as well. And um, I'll back, have you back up to that slide, uh, the predator slide for me just a minute. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you might also think about uh, different predators as being able to hear different frequencies of sound. Um, so like a toy that I always enjoy playing with is a boom whacker. Here I have a very short one, which is going to make a higher frequency of sound. And I have a very long one, which I'm going to back up so you can see. Yeah, I got to get further back. <laughs> really long one that makes a deeper or lower frequency of sound. Those ears that we were talking about earlier, the little ears or the big ears also can determine different frequencies of sound. Um, let's think about an animal that really has a huge ear like an elephant. I read this week and thought that it was pretty fascinating that elephants in particular have, communicate with very, very low frequency sounds, even lower than that very long boom whacker that I just showed you, <clears throat> so low that our ears cannot hear that sound. On the other hand, there are animals like bats that have a very high frequency sound, and um, some of us cannot hear it either. As I get older, and um, maybe some of the other people will have discovered this too, the frequency that we can hear of both lower and higher sounds, yeah, uh, the gap kind of in decreases so that we're not able to hear those beautiful sounds that they make. But we would probably never have been able to listen in on an elephant conversation because their rumblings are so low in frequency. Um, I mentioned earlier, and now we'll look at that prey slide, if we can, that um, some prey are able to move their ears um, almost 180 degrees as they're wiggling up on top of their head in order to help them to hear things in the wild. So here are three animals, um, a rabbit, a sheep, and a fennec fox that you might find in the desert that um, are, allow them to really turn those ears in all directions So because they're generally prey animals and not predators that uh, is gonna help to protect them as their ears are turning around. Um, you know, some humans also have this genetic ability to wiggle their ears. And I tried it the other day, I can't do it, but it involves a muscle right here next to your ear that allows you that capability to wiggle your ears. And um, deer in particular, if you are, have the uh, opportunity to get up close to a deer and watch them wiggle their ears as they're trying to hear all of the sounds around them, uh, um, they can do that very easily. Now, some people can do it, and I watched YouTube videos this week training you how to wiggle your ears so that you can pick up sounds a little bit better like some animals in the wild. Um, then one other thing is that ears are not always where we expect them to be. So our next slide talks about some animals that we might find that you would find ears in different places. Like for instance, uh, you might find them on the legs of an animal, or you might find them like in the grasshopper picture, um, uh, somewhere on their abdomen. And uh, their ears are more of like a, just a covered layer. Um, another animal that you might find ears in different places, or not as you have, have thought they would be like, would be an owl. Let's get it in the right place, right here on the side of this owl's head is the cavity or opening where you can see the ear. It does not have the pinna or that funnel, but yet owls have excellent hearing. 
Some owls will have an ear a little further up on the head and some will have a little lower. And that makes it more like stereo sound, like if you were in a theater and uh, they do that commercial at the beginning of the theater and the sound travels around the room. That's kind of like how an owl might hear. So lots of fascinating things about the ears of animals in the wild. And let's go on to the next question, uh, naturalist. Awesome, thank you so much, Deb. I just learned a lot about ears. So uh, I, our next naturalist will be Erica. Erica, um, what, what got you interested in senses or what's the sense that you're most interested in? Well, Lindsay, the sense that is most interesting to me is I would say smell because um, being an animal, you can smell all sorts of things. And so the first one I want to talk about, the first animal I would like to talk about is a turkey vulture. So this turkey vulture actually lives here in Wichita. His name is Chuck and he uh, lives at the Kansas Wildlife Exhibit over in Riverside Park. Um, and I've actually got, been fortunate enough to actually work with him and learn a lot about how he, his senses work. And his, he uses most of uh, his smell senses to be able to find his food. So in the next slide, you'll get a, a close up picture of what looks like his nostrils, but actually those aren't his nostrils. So that's just a big bony structure that protects the nostrils. So his nostrils are actually in the way back of those holes. And so they protect the nostrils because when he eats a, like a dead animal or something, he'll tend to bury his nose or beak into that animal. And so if he were to get any food in those holes, he would just use his talons to be able to claw that meat out of his nose. That way that um, the nostril is cleaned out. So he actually has the largest olfactory system in the bird, the bird world. And in the next slide, you'll, you'll see two pictures of a brain. So an olfactory system is basically just a big meaning of where it, it's the, the part of the brain that helps Chuck control the smells. So in this picture, you'll see the top picture is a picture of a black vulture brain. And then the bottom, the bottom picture is the turkey vulture brain. So the OB stands for the olfactory bulb, and that's basically the part of his brain that controls smells. Um, and as you can see, it's twice as large as the black vulture, the black vulture olfactory bulb. So Chuck can actually smell carrion or dead, dead animals that are less than 24 hours old, um, and it can be more than a mile away. And then in the next slide, So turkey vultures are actually, we consider them the nature's cleanup crew. And basically that means he can clean, he uh, is in charge of cleaning up all the dead animals basically. So they mainly feed on dead animals and, um, and that can also prevent diseases. So their stomach acid is actually very strong. So that, so when they feed on those dead animals, if they were to have a disease or something such as a uh, salmonella, um, it can, it wouldn't cause the vulture any ill, any ill. So his stomach acid would actually kill the bacteria and toxins and it will stop the disease right there. So no animal that, um, were to eat the turkey vulture, they wouldn't get any disease off of them. And then the next, the second uh, animal that I think has a really cool sense of smell is the snakes because they actually smell with their tongues. Um, that's not to say that they don't have nostrils because they do smell through their nostrils, but they, they uh, use the best sense of smell through their tongues. And the reason why is um, the odor particles on their, they can, they can detect the odor particles through their tongues. And then once they retract their tongue, it, the odor particles go back into these holes at the top of their mouth. And those are actually called the Jacobson's organ. And since these holes are completely separated, 
oh in the next in the next slide so in the picture you can see that um it points to the jacobson organ so that jacobson organ those holes are completely separated from the nasal cavity or or the nose and that means that the only way that those odor particles that he had uh that the snake had been able to uh detect the only way that they would get through to him is through his mouth and then the other part, the other thing that is interesting about snakes is that they, most snakes have a forked tongue, which allows them to be able to, to, to be able to detect in the direction that the smell came from. So yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Erica. I think we're ready for Emily now. <laughs> it was on her way. Emily, what gets you the most excited about senses? What is your favorite sense and why? Okay. So my favorite sense is eyesight. Um, I just, I love being able to see things. And I think most of us are also visual learners. Um, that's how a lot of people learn is like by watching stuff and um, looking at it and trying to learn more about it. Um, so I love eyesight. I, I, I think it's one of like the most useful senses personally, not to throw shade at you guys. Um, but I think it's a very, very useful sense. Um, but what I think is the most amazing thing about eyesight, like obviously it helps, it helps us be able to look around and appreciate things. It helps animals to be able to look for, out for predators. It helps them be able to find food. Um, but I think just more than that is that we get to see colors and we get to see like just the beauty of a lot of things through our eyes. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about how, how we see color and how animals see color and how they kind of view the world and how that's different between humans and other animals because they don't necessarily use their eyes the same way that we do and their eyes might look and act completely differently than ours do as well. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to start out talking about is, well, how do we see color? So we can kind of get like a baseline on how do humans um, see color? So I'm gonna have Rachel pu pull up the little color Venn diagram thing. Uh, Venn diagram. Do, do, do. And so what we're going to be looking at, I think, yeah, some of my pictures got out of order. That's my bad. Um, so we have this little color Venn diagram. And so what you see, the three big ones on here are going to be yellow, red, and blue. A lot of you may recognize that as the three primary colors. And so the reason those three primary colors are so important is that actually that corresponds to kinds of cones in our eyes. So that's not something that we can actually see in our eyes, but cones in our eyes are something that actually help us to be able to see color. So these little tiny, tiny cones in your eyes help you to be able to see color. You also have something else in your eyes called rods that help you to see light, but we'll talk a little bit more about those later. But for humans, we have three different kinds of cones in our eyes, and there's a bunch of each of those three different kinds. So we have our red cones, our blue cones, and our yellow cones. Um, so really when you get down to it, that's pretty much the only colors we can technically see. Um, so you might be thinking that's a lie. Like I can definitely see more colors than that, um, but you're wrong. So if you look at this Venn diagram, you'll notice that the colors in the middle, so orange, um, purple, green, those are just mixes of the three primary colors. So if you've ever mixed paints and stuff, you're basically just using the three main colors that our eyes can see and turning them into different colors. But your brain basically, or your eyes basically know how to see red, yellow, and blue. Um, but that's not true for most animals. So we have those three different kinds of cones. A lot of animals, some may have less, um, and not really be able to see color, whereas others may have a lot more. So I wanna go to a very special animal, and, which is called the mantis shrimp. 
And so I'll have Rachel pull up a picture of that mantis shrimp. And these are just even looking at them, they are kind of amazing creatures. Um, but they have something really, really special about them. This is an animal that not only looks like a rainbow and looks absolutely amazing, but they have amazing eyes too, some of the most complex eyes in the world. Like each of them can move on their own. Like if we're looking around, like your eyes pretty much move together. That's just how they work. They can move both of theirs separately and they have three different sets of compound eyes all on that one little thing. Now I think I even have a picture of their eyes up close to, yeah, and that just, that's very strange looking. That's a very weird looking eye that looks nothing like ours, but that's not even the most amazing thing about their eyes. So we, remember I said we have three different kinds of those cones in our eyes. So for red, yellow, and blue, these guys, can have 12 to 16 different kinds. So that means that they can see colors that we cannot even imagine or fathom, which is crazy. Like I can't even think about that there's colors out there that I don't know how to see. So there's some creatures like that that are just absolutely amazing and see the world completely differently than we do because they have different kinds of eyes, uh, which is just so cool. So now I'm going to have uh, her pull up that, I think it's called this electromagnetic spectrum. I think that was that first picture. Um, and so that'll kind of give you a better picture of, so what can we actually see as humans? If apparently there's some animals that see way better than we do. So this has um, in the actual like rainbow color is the visible light. So all color is actually based around how we view light and how our eyes interpret light. So we have this visible light, um, and that's what we as humans can see every day. That's just completely normal vision. Um, that mantis shrimp is able to see a little bit into ultraviolet light. So we have that big black bar up there, and to the left of where that rainbow is, it says ultraviolet rays. You may recognize or have heard of that because that's what comes from the sun and gets you sunburnt. I know I get really sunburnt because I'm super pale. Um, so that's what gets me sunburnt. Um, but that mantis shrimp can see a little bit into that UV spectrum. Um, so ultraviolet is UV. Uh, there's some animals that can see really deep into the UV spectrum. Um, so a lot of insects can actually see in UV. So we're still kind of on the topic of color, but really it's um, it's just that some of them interpret color very differently. So I'll have you picture, picture, pull up that picture of some flowers. So those these flowers that are coming up, so on, I think it's my left, I'm not sure if it's your left, um, there's that bright yellow flower. So that's how we would see a nice little flower. But on the right is how things like bees or butterflies might actually see flowers. Um, so kind of kind of nuts. So they're seeing in UV, which is something that is technically invisible to us. We have no way of seeing that. Our eyes don't know how to see it. But there's a lot of insects and other animals that are actually able to see. So it completely changes how they view the world. And actually for bees and stuff helps them to be able to find pollen and nectar. So there are some ways we're like able to mimic how we see UV light. So I have a little UV flashlight. These are ones you can buy online also, and you can shine it on stuff. And it kind of helps make things to be able to glow. Um, I know like things like scorpions, if you look up pictures of like scorpions under black light, they'll kind of show up and that's that UV, they glow in UV, but some animals just normally see that way. Now on the other side of that spectrogram, and you don't have to necessarily pull it up, but we looked at the left side that was UV, on the right side was infrared light. And that's going to be the last way I talk about animals seeing um, is with infrared. And so that infrared light is something that sometimes snakes will use. So we have a picture of a snake that Rachel will pull up. Um, on this, you can kind of see that little nair, that nostril that Erica was talking about earlier. That's where the black arrow is pointing. But behind it is another hole where a red arrow is pointing. So this is what a little like pit, um, what is it called? It's called a pit 
I'm blanking, but yeah, it's some kind of pit. They'll be called pit vipers. So this is um, from a viper, a rattlesnake. And that actually helps them to be able to sense infrared light. So it doesn't technically have to do with their eyesight. So I'm kind of cheating a little bit, um, but it does have to do with how they view the world. They're using this extra like little heat sensing thing to view the world. So it actually will kind of light up like a heat signature. So if there's like a rat roaming around, they might not actually be able to visibly see it with their eye, but this little pit right there um, will help them see the heat from that animal and be able to find and eat that animal. So it's a really cool other sense. Um, so there is all sorts of animals that out there that see completely different than we do. Um, and this is just a little bit of a taste of some of those animals. So yeah really, really cool animals out there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Now, just a friendly reminder to those who are watching out there, this is a great opportunity to submit any questions that you have about the senses that our three naturalists have already talked about. Um, and I do have a few questions to ask you. So if you get your comments and questions in the chat box, we can get those answered as well. But our first question is going to be for Deb. And our first question of the program today is, how do animals see at night? So I'll let Deb take that one over. Oh, this is one of the most exciting things I first learned when I came to the Nature Center to work <clears throat> is about eye shine is a common term for it, but it really has to do with a special adaptation that animals who spend are nocturnal or spend more of their time wandering around at night looking for food have that we as humans don't have. For one thing, they have a mirrored surface at the back of their eye, kind of like this one that I'm holding up right now. And as light approaches their eye, it goes to that mirrored surface at the back of their eye. It bounces off and it looks like their eyes are glowing. It's just fantastic. This time of year is an excellent time to go out when it's just dusk or a little bit right after dark, maybe with a small flashlight similar to the one that uh, Emily showed you earlier. If you'll hold the flashlight up here by your eyes and then look out into an open area, probably the best place is usually along a place where it's been mowed or like I have a row of trees in my backyard. That would be a great place to try this out. And if you shine that flashlight out into the area and maybe look at the ground or up in the trees, you might get that reflection of light coming back to your eyes off of the eye of a nocturnal animal like an opossum, or I think that I had um, one of a beautiful picture that was um, given to us by Bob Grass to use for our programming. This one, I hope that will be coming up soon is of a bullfrog and they have the most beautiful eye shine. Emily talked about colors earlier and the different kinds of colors that animals can see, but their eyes also reflect different colors depending on the makeup of that <clears throat> layer at the back of their eye. So here is what the eye shine of a bullfrog would look like at night. And again, if you were going out looking for this, you might put a small flashlight up here about your, uh, near your eye. You don't wanna to get too close to the animal. You wanna stand back a little ways, probably about six feet is the best way to catch that glimmer of light uh, reflecting back off the mirror at the back of the animal's eye. So that's how uh, animals see a little bit better at night and you might give it a try. Spider sniffing, which is what I call going out and looking for that eye shine is a wonderful thing to do at this time of year. Cool. So, man, I wish I could see at night as well as a possum does. That would be an absolute <laughs> game changer. Um, we do have a question from a viewer. Elizabeth would like to know, do dogs see in color? I could probably take that one if that's cool. Okay, cool. Go for it. Um, so not really, no. So I mentioned a little bit about those cones in our eyes. And I briefly mentioned the rods as well. So the cones help us see color. So they both start with the C, which is very handy. But the rods help us see light. And so dogs mainly have those rods in their eyes. So 
they have a little bit of the cone, so they mainly kind of see in shades of gray, so like a little bit of color, but not near as much as we have. But those rods are way more important for them because dogs, um, since they're like related to wolves and stuff, are actually adapted to hunt at nighttime. So those rods in their eyes are way, way more important because they just need to be able to see things clearly. They need to be able to see things really clearly at night. So they might, their eyes mainly focus on light and brightening up the light rather than having color. So they kind of see in like grayscale. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see here. We do have another question that has um, this one's going to be for Erica. So Erica, what kind of things can animals smell? That's a good question. Um, so animals can smell more things than just uh, for food. They can actually smell things that might be dangerous. So like if, an, if a coyote were to uh, pee around a surf, his like area, he wants to protect and, and another animal comes and smells that scent, he might know that that's a dangerous area and he wants to go and he should probably leave. Um, they can also smell potential mates. So some animals will actually travel over miles to get to that scent and get to their mate. Um, and then they, like deer can smell their own herd or even their own young. And when a deer had, and when a female deer has a baby, they tend to lick off the baby's scent so that uh, a potential like predator might not be able to smell them in order to be able to protect that their young. So they can smell things like danger, their mates, their babies, and food. Awesome. Okay. So I do have, I have one more question and let's, we're going to have Emily answer this one. Emily, um, why does a catfish have whiskers? <laughs> okay. So this is a scent that we didn't really, or a sense that we didn't get really to talk about. So cool. Um, so catfish are, you know, one of the few like non-mammal animals that have whiskers because a lot of times we see like the dogs and cats and other furry mammals that have whiskers. Um, those are usually used for like sensing things around them so to kind of find their way around them and also to find food and catfish actually use them for a pretty similar reason so it helps them get a picture of their world around them because usually catfish are swimming around on the bottom and um, there's one that we have here in our aquarium and you'll usually see him around the bottom swimming around and he's actually dragging those whiskers kind of around the bottom as well. And so he's getting a picture of his world and also looking for food because catfish have something super special on their little whiskers or barbels. And that's actually taste buds. They just have like all of these different taste buds covering their whiskers so they can actually taste <laughs> whenever they're dragging their whiskers along the floor of like a lake or something and see if what they're tasting is food or not and if they want to eat it. So that is actually what they use their whiskers for. That is so weird. I literally cannot imagine what it would be like to have your taste buds like out here. I don't know. It's super weird. But anyway, that is a wrap up of all the questions that we have today. Uh, who knew we're, there were so many things involving senses? I mean, we do have a lot of them and each one has a bunch of different things involved with them. So just a quick heads up to all of the students and teachers out there watching. Our next Nature Chatters is on October 9th. That's next Friday. It takes place at 10 a.m. and is all about flight and animals. If you know other teachers or homeschoolers who might be interested in attending future programs like this one, a full schedule can be found on our website along with the form to pre-submit any questions that you might have about the topic of the hour. All of these nature programs are recorded and, av and available for later view on our YouTube channel. So if you're an adult out there who knows someone who might enjoy learning about census, feel free to go ahead and share this video with them. Thank you to Rachel and Alan who are behind the scenes running our tech today. Shout out to Deb, Erica, and Emily who answered all of your questions and told you more about census. Again, my name is Lindsay. I was your host for today and I hope you enjoyed today's program. Now go out there